We thank you for your kindness and your mercy for drawing us closer and closer to yourself. I thank you for your desire to work in us and to transform us more and more to be like you. I ask your blessings on this meeting. I ask that your words would extend into our hearts and that they would produce forth fruit that would glorify and honor you. We ask, dear Lord, that your presence would work in us and be with the children and all the services right now. In your precious name, through the session of St. Mary and the witnesses of the Holy Transfiguration, hear us when we say with one voice, Our Father, who art in heaven, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one through Christ Jesus our Lord. For that is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever and ever. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Hope you're doing well. You know what the teacher does at the beginning of the class, right? They always check your homework. I gave you homework last week. Did anyone do it? What was the homework? The psalm. The psalm. Which one? There's only 151 of them. Okay, good. You guys are supposed to sing, Oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. So if you didn't remember, then I guess early we didn't seek him. <laughs> so um, I do try to give you something that will be practical for you, and it's important that you try to follow up. So last week, we've been... By the way, you have your Bibles, right? Good, because uh, the PowerPoint uh, is my fault. I didn't send the PowerPoint to the email, so that's my bad. And um, I expect you guys to have your Bibles. You can highlight your own Bibles. You don't need my PowerPoint, right? Good. So we've been speaking about contentment last few weeks, and I realized that the last week I quoted a lot of verses of Philippians, which is actually one of my favorite books. And I kept thinking about Philippians over and over, and I said, you know what, why don't we just talk about the book of Philippians? How many of you, Philippians is one of your top five favorite books? Okay, no one. Okay, well then let's, <laughs> let, let, let's try and get it there. I want you to open your Bibles to Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. Okay, so a lot of, a lot of the verses, most of them will be Philippians. Uh, I have a few that are outside of the Philippians. But sometimes what I like to do is I like to take one of St. Paul's epistles and I try to break it up and see what are the themes that go throughout the book and try to connect them in one way so that I can come out with a one main message for the book. So there's a key verse in chapter 1, verse 6. It says, Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. That shows that God is working in us that we probably, many of us, are, are in our beginning stages or middle stages, but he has a goal. When he wrote this to the Philippians, the beginning was them turning from idols and coming to Jesus Christ. That was the beginning of their salvation. Father David mentioned the verse in uh, Hebrews today about Christ being the author and finisher of our faith. He's the beginning and the end. But what I want you to realize is that you are a work in progress. Who's doing the work? It says, He has begun the work in you. He's going to complete it until the end. A lot of the time we feel like we're in this alone and life is so hard, but we forget that God is working inside of us. You guys know the example of the clay in the potter's hand. It's a very famous example in the book of Jeremiah. I'll read it to you. It's Jeremiah 18 if you want to open. Jeremiah 18 verses 3 through 6. So God told Jeremiah to go to the potter's house. He says, I went to the potter's house and there he was making something at the wheel. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. Do you know what marred means? It was messed up or broken. 
So he made it again into another vessel as it seemed good to the potter to make. So he was working on something. It didn't look like it was going to be good or it was messed up a little bit. So he made it again into something that he thought would be good. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter, says the Lord? Look, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand. So God is working in us and we are like a clay in the potter's hand. Now, sometimes in some of the verses uh, in the Bible, it says, can the clay say to the potter, why did you make me like this? And the clay is complaining to the potter, who's in charge? Who has the master plan? It's the potter. And sometimes the clay comes out messed up. Why? Because the clay wasn't willing to be worked with. It was a difficult piece of clay and it wasn't allowing itself to be molded. God is working in us, and He has a plan. He's trying to fashion us into something amazing. If you look at Colossians 1.29, so right after Philippians is Colossians chapter 1, it's the very last verse. He says, To this end I labor, this is St. Paul, striving according to His working, which works in me mightily. St. Paul says, I'm working hard according to his working that's working in me in a mighty way. If you look at what St. Paul became, was it St. Paul's effort? It was God working in him that allowed him to become who he was. So then I have a question. St. Paul says, God is working in me mightily in a very effective way. Is he working in us in the same way? Maybe he's trying, but there's not the same result. Why is the same effort from God in us not producing the same result? It's like the clay that's not willing to be molded. Maybe it's not ready to be just let go of and let the potter do the work. And St. Paul says that he was laboring. He says, I'm working according to his working. So we're both working. God is working. We're working. Who's doing most of the work? God. You know what it means when the word synergy? You know what synergy is? When two parts work together, but the sum is greater than the individual parts, like one plus two is like five. Okay? So we put our hands in God's, allow him to work is greater than what you could do on your own. So, a lot of us are not thinking of God working in us, and maybe we're resisting God. Instead of working together, which is synergy, energy together, we're working against Him. And then we wonder why there isn't the same result. So you have to ask yourself, are you asking God to mold you, that the work that He has begun, are you asking Him to complete it? Well, what is the goal of His working? Let's look at Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. He says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as my presence only, how much more in my absence? He says, Work out your own salvation in fear and trembling. He says, You do the work, but he says, For it is God who works in you to will and to do for his good pleasure. So he's saying, I need you to work for your salvation, not that you're going to earn it, not that you're going to capture salvation on your own, but you have to work with God who's trying to change your will and your actions. He says, who is working in you to will and to do for his pleasure. So God is working in us, and this clay pot that he's trying to make, he's really working on our will, and our actions. So one of the most beautiful things that you will see in a person's life is when one person's will has conformed to the will of God. Where God directs them, they go. Where God inspires them, where God tells them not to go, they don't. Where there's a need, they move if God moves them. One of the things that we need to do is to have our will conformed to His will 
And to have our actions, he says, to do. So our actions resembling God's. It says, he's, we're asking, he's working on us to will and to do for His good pleasure. He's not acting and trying to conform our will to our pleasure, but it's for His pleasure. He's the potter. He's the one that has the right to mold the clay into what He sees will be most beneficial and most beautiful. So it's important. He's trying to make us to become like Him. When God made us in Genesis, when God made Adam and Eve, He said what? He said, let us make man in our image and according to our likeness. So the image of God is that there is a resemblance, that we have the image of God, but what is the likeness? It's our behavior. If you go to Romans 8.29 really quick, this is God made us in the beginning according to His image and likeness. But in Romans, this is after Christ dying and resurrecting and giving us our salvation, it says this, Whom He foreknew, He predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son. We were predestined to always be the image of His Son. So we're supposed to be like Christ. The work that God is doing in us is to try to transform us so that we could become more Christ-like. And I don't know if we ever think of that. We say, I'm supposed to be a better Christian. A lot of time we don't think, I'm just supposed to be me. You are supposed to be you, but through Christ's actions and mind and ways. And we're going to see that. So in the Old Testament, it was very hard to be in His likeness. Remember, the likeness is God's behavior. How could they be like God, the one who parted the Red Seas and clothed the mouths of lions and brought down lightning? And th How could they imitate that? So then God gave us Jesus Christ. When someone says, can you act like God? We'd say, well, let me see what Jesus Christ did. Remember that whole movement? What would Jesus Christ do? All of a sudden, that became the mentality. You guys know what Jesus Christ did. You know what His actions like. You know what His words were like. And you saw how He dealt with sinners and with religious people and strangers. And you could see His actions. That's His likeness. Now, that's what we are supposed to imitate. It's not easy. And you can do nothing without the grace of God and the Holy Spirit. You can't say, well, tomorrow I'm just going to imitate Christ and I'll be perfect. No. It's a process that requires progress. Remember, God begun a good work. He's going to complete it, but we have to work together with Him. So we're giving something in Philippians to imitate in Christ. If we're supposed to imitate Christ, it's very vague, right? So then St. Paul says, I have something for you to imitate. If you go to chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. Probably one of the most beautiful passages St. Paul has written, one of the most beautiful passages in all of the Bible. It describes to us who Jesus Christ is. And I love this verse, just 2 verse 5. He says, Let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus. So what is he saying to imitate? The mindset of Jesus Christ. That's the first thing he's telling us. You need to imitate the mindset of Jesus Christ. Well, what was the mindset? Who, being in the form of God, did not consider robbery to be equal with God. The form of God, I'm not going to go over this, but this is all about his divinity and how he let go of the glory of his divinity and became man. This requires a whole series in itself, but just the idea that the form, the Greek word is morph, which is, means you cannot change its form like it's always God he was in the form of God like he was something that's not changeable where he kind of let it go to become human okay so he's just trying to prove his divinity he said he made himself of no reputation he took the form of a bond servant as if bond servant enough he says coming in the likeness of men so he came as a man but it wasn't just any man he came as a bond servant and says and being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself even more. And he became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. He says, let that mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus, 
who had this reputation, who had this glory, who had this essence of being God, who left it all, who made himself of no reputation, who humbled himself more and more and more. He says the mind that Jesus Christ had was absolute selflessness, absolute humility, absolute obedience to the Father. He says, let that mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. And again, this is one of the most beautiful, if you were to go deep into it, one of the most beautiful passages about Christ. So this is God's goal for us to have the mind of Christ. Is that possible for us to just have the mind of Christ? You know, when I sit and think, what would it be like to have the mind of Christ when you look into a room, you're looking at the needs of people. You might be able to see the one who's suffering. You might see the one who's, who's jobless, the one who's depressed, the one who's dis in despair. You would probably seek them out with such compassion. Is it possible to have the mind of Christ? Is it kind of crazy? Not according to St. Paul, because if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, so go back a few chapters in your Bible, a few books. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he says something amazing that goes along with this. In chapter 2, in verse 10 through 12, and then verse 16, he says, God has revealed to us through his Spirit. He said, the Spirit searches all things, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. So who knows the mind of God other than the spirit of God? And he says, and the spirit revealed them to us. And if you look at the very last verse in that chapter, it says, but we have the mind of Christ. St. Paul says, we have the mind of Christ. How? How? by the Holy Spirit that's in God and also in us, revealing to us what the mind is. So is it possible? Yes. But is that your goal? It's supposed to be our goal that we should have the mind of Christ. We're going to go into it a little bit more. But you realize that what St. Paul is talking about is a changing or a renewal of the mind. There's a famous verse in Romans 12 too, which everyone, since we just looked at Romans, Romans 12, 2, I'll read it to you. It says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the what? By the renewing of your mind. So you are God's beginning a work. You're in the beginning. In order to get to the end, we have to transform the way we think. He says, Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed. Totally a new form by the changing of your mind. God's working in us according to his pleasure and it requires the renewing of the mind so that we could have the mind of Christ. Now, I wish I, I had the PowerPoint, but I looked up the word mind in Philippians. You know how many chapters is Philippians? Four chapters. He mentions the word mind, like-minded, 11 times. He says to them over and over, I'm not going to read all of them, he says, uh, stand fast in one spirit with one mind. He says, fulfill my joy by being like-minded of one mind. Christ had lowliness of mind. He said, let this mind which was in Christ Jesus be in you. He says, have this mind that are those who are mature. He says, be of the same mind. He says, same mind over and over and over. In one small book, he keeps focusing on our minds and our mindset and the way we think. And he gave us the ultimate example. What is the most important mind we're supposed to have? It's the mind of Christ. If your mind changes, your mindset, then what will change? Your actions. Remember, God wants to will and to do. Anyone just want to lose 30 pounds by the end of summer? But if it's not really in your mind, <laughs> I was hoping no one would admit, but I mean, I, I don't have 30 pounds, so you know, <laughs> I need 40. But like, if it's not in your mind, if your mind is not set, then your actions will not follow. The most important thing in order for God to will and to do is for your mind to be transformed. And he says over and over and over, your mind has to change. Well, let's go back. He says you need to change your mind to be like Christ. That was in Philippians. You guys know that verse? The famous passage in Philippians chapter 2. 
verse 5 to 8. You got to know, it's like one of the best passages in all of the Bible and in the New Testament. If it's one of the best passages in the Bible, that means it's one of the best passages ever written. Okay? So Philippians chapter 2, 5 to 8 is about Christ. But right before that, he gives us an example of what it is to be like Christ. What does it mean to have the mindset of Christ? He says in chapter 2, verse 1, if there is, sorry, I'm going to go to chapter uh, 2, verse 2. He says, fulfill my joy by being like-minded. So he says, have the same mind, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. He says over and over, we need to have one mind. Let's all think the same way. He says this, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. But in lowliness of mind, esteem others better than himself. So, number one, don't do anything out of selfish ambition or conceit. But consider others better than yourself. Wow, that's tough. And then number two says, let each of you look out not for his own interest, but also the interests of others. So let's, let's think about this. This is the example because then he says, have the same mind that Christ did where he didn't, he, if anyone could have had selfish ambition or conceit, it was Jesus Christ. If anyone could have done anything, it, it was harder for someone to esteem themselves, like he esteemed others better than himself. Did he consider his own interests when he came to earth? He gave it all up. He wasn't thinking about his interests. He was thinking about ours. He wasn't doing anything. He had lowliness of mind. He even says, come to me, for I am lowly and gentle of heart. That's who he was. He says he wants you to be like that. Don't be selfish. Esteem others better than yourself. Well, that's pretty hard. You want to know why? Because we don't see value in other people. We always look down at them and say, oh, this person has that flaw and that person has that flaw. Why do we do that? Because of pride. Because if you lower others, then all of a sudden you've raised yourself. The problem is that we don't see the value in them because we don't see that they are a creation of God, created in the image of God. Every single one of you in here and every single one out there, regardless of what they look like on the outside, they actually are the image of God in them. And we look at them with less value because of the way they dress, or their hair, their tattoos, the whatever they're smoking or whatever. But they all, so we don't give them value. You will never consider someone higher, esteem them higher, if you don't give them value. And you want to know the people that you give the most value to? The ones you love. The ones you love. And so if we're not giving people value, it's probably because we're not really very loving. Those whom you love, I mean, look at your children. All right, you would probably give you know, two kidneys in your spouse's kidney for, for them, right? Like you would do anything for your children because you love them. Are they better than you? You may not esteem them, but you because you love them, you will take care of their interests before yours. If I were to describe a real, true Christian, they would probably be these two characteristics. They're always looking out for the interests of others, not just their own. And they are honoring everyone around them. And he says this, now can you see how this is going from the beginning? Okay, now you believe in Jesus Christ, all of a sudden you're moving up and becoming more like Christ. He says this is the mindset. It's being other focused, focused on others, even as it was for Christ, even if it's humiliating, even if it's painful. Now I want you to realize the goal is not to be humble and focus on yourself. If Christ was just to be lowly and come to the earth, then go back, what was the point? The whole point was because the humility was united with love. And because of that humility united with love, it became other focus. He began to see the interests of others. That needs to be our mentality. Christ, St. Paul is telling us, we, Christ began a good work. He wants you to grow to be like Christ. These are the steps along the path to think less of ourself, to think of greater value in others, and also to seek the interests of others. You know the people that you love the most are the people, the ones that you call them in a moment, they're going to drop whatever they're going to do and they're going to be at your side. You're like, I love that person. And you know what? That's the person that's most like Christ. So that's where we're headed to. 
That's where we need to move towards. Another aspect of God's work, and just like you, when you have children, they're beautiful when they're babies, but what is your desire? That they would grow. That they would have a mature mindset. That eventually they will stop saying, me, me, me. So in Philippians chapter 3, Christ talks about this exactly. He says in verse 12, we're going to read 12 to 14. He says, Not that I've already attained or I'm already perfected. So this is St. Paul at the end of his life, one of the last books he wrote. He says, I haven't already reached there. I'm not already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ has laid hold of me. I don't count myself to have apprehended. One thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. That's important. And I'm reaching for those things which are ahead. I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus. In verse 15, he says this, Therefore, let as many as are mature have this mind. Here he's talking about a mature mind. So what is the mature mind he's talking about? St. Paul, who has probably converted more people to Christ than anyone in the history of mankind, he suffered more for Christ than any of the other apostles. He traveled more, he labored more, and he says, but I'm not there yet. I got to keep going. What? And he says, that's the mature mind. Don't think you're already there. How many of us feel like, I'm a good enough Christian. I'm going to heaven. I'm good enough. St. Paul, with all that he did, said, I'm not there yet. I press on. What does he mean he presses on towards the goal? What is the image? Pressing on towards the goal of a prize, what's the image? To be Christ-minded. But he's, he's actually painting for people in this age, they know what, like that's an example of a race. I have my mind and my eyes set on the prize. I'm heading towards that. I will press on. No matter what is around me, I will not be distracted. I have to get to the end. Nothing will stop me. How many of us have that mentality? I am moving forward. Many of us are just happy staying still. You're in a race. Are you trying to reach the goal? How important is the prize to you? Are you moving forward? Are you moving backwards? Or are you standing still? If you're standing still in the race, guess what happens? You're going to be last. Everyone else is moving past you. This is the mature mind. But he says, I have to forget everything in the past. Why would you forget everything in the past? Did St. Paul have a good past or a bad past? A lot of both. He had a lot of both. Before he was Christian, right? He was persecuting Christians. He was putting them in jail. He had a very bad past. But did he have a good past? He had a good past as a Jew. He was blameless in the law. He was a Pharisee. He was very zealous. He was like born of the tribe of Ben. Like his credentials as a Jew were amazing. He says, I forgot that. Also, all the works that I've done, all the suffering, all that, I put it behind me. Why? Why? Because you could fall, if you look at the bad things, you're going to fall into despair and say, I really have no, I've done so much bad. How could I move forward? I'll never get to the end. It's so far away. He doesn't want you to fall into despair, but what's the problem of looking at the good things? If you say, wow, look at all the things I've done. I got nothing else I got to do. I'm good. So then you're going to not press on. You're going to stop. He says, the mature mind continues until your last breath. How long do you think Satan will fight you? Until when? until your last breath, until your last breath. He is trying to get you to not get to the end and he will fight you until your last breath. And so we're, one of the fathers says, do not trust yourself this side of the grave. We will move on and we will fight until our last breath. And so he says, this is the mature mind. Don't think that you're already there or that you're good enough. But we have to continue to improve, to become more Christ-like. I don't mean to like deflate you. Okay, maybe we're all like a B minus. Maybe a B plus, maybe a B plus. But we're not satisfied with that. We're going towards, towards Christ. And it will benefit not just you, but it will benefit all those around you, especially those of your household, if you are pressing to become 
more like Christ. So again, this is the mature mind. So then, let's talk about more of the mature mind. Some of the best verses in the Bible are in Philippians. So let's just go to Philippians 1.21. I'm sorry, I'm a verses guy. I like us to look at verses and learn all the good verses. Um, in, so this is St. Paul. He's in prison. He doesn't know if he's going to be martyred. And he says something incredible. He says this, For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. He says, but if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I can't tell. I'm hard pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. What an amazing mentality. He says, my desire, I'm either going to live or die. I kind of torn. If I die, I get to be with Christ, which is so much better. How many of us, as we're getting older, are looking forward to being there or we're trying to do as much as we can to establish ourselves here how many of us are running towards the kingdom how many of us are trying to hold on to the prize the sad thing is is that we're not we're trying to build earthly kingdoms and not heavenly kingdoms he says to die is gain but he says but for me to live is Christ I love that for me to live is Christ. that means where does my strength front come from he says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. My strength comes from Christ. What's my plan for the day? Christ. What's my joy for the day? Christ. What's my long-term plan? It's Christ and His kingdom. What's my concern for those around me? It's Christ. My service is Christ. My mind is Christ. My heart is Christ. If you read about how He loves the Philippians in chapter 1, he says, I love you with the affection of Christ, which means that he's not just his mind is Christ, but his, his heart is Christ. Wow, for me to live is Christ. How much for us to live is Christ? That's a mature mind. So for me to live is not me and then Christ. No, for me to live is no longer me, just Christ. In Galatians, he says, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. That's it. No longer I've been crucified. St. Paul is crucified. No longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. And the life that I now live, I live in faith for the one who loved me and gave himself for me. My life is Christ. What if that became, if I gave you homework, but this one is not due next week. It's due at your last breath. For me to live is Christ. What if that became the focus of HTC of you, of your families. For us to live is Christ. And if we die, and you know, I have a friend that just told me uh, he has a very bad cancer, just found out out of the blue. How many of us are saying, well, that just means I'm that much closer. That dying is gain. For a Christian, if we didn't have the resurrection, it would be miserable. But we do. And we'll talk about that in the next verses. Another part of the mature mindset is Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 to 11. I might have gone over this last week, but it says, Those things that were gained to me, I've counted loss for Christ. That's the mature mindset. All the diplomas he had that I was a Pharisee, that I was a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin, and all this stuff. So that, I counted loss. So all those things, as we get older, there's certain things, you're like, you know what? I don't need that. Certain things become less valuable to you. As you get in your life, and you're like, ah, uh, what's really important? Everything else is, is rubbish. He says, I count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. I count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ. That I may gain Christ? St. Paul, you didn't already have Christ. It seems like you've already gained him. He says, that I would be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness which is from God by faith. He's, but I want you to pay attention to verse 10. It says, that I may know him. What? Of all the people, of all the things you wrote about Jesus Christ, you've written the most beautiful things about Jesus Christ, and he says, that I may know him. It's interesting that this is the part of the mature mind, that I want to know him more. If you look at St. Paul and some of the things, 
He actually gives God different names. You know, in chapter 4, verse 9, in the same book, you'll begin to understand when he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. But he talks about, in verse 9, he says, The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. He calls him the God of peace. In 2 Corinthians, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. He gives him a name, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. In Galatians 2, God who loved me and gave himself for me. In uh, 2 Timothy, he who is faithful. In Hebrews, he's the high priest. And in 2 Corinthians, he says, he who is rich who became poor. And he says, but I just want to know him more. How many of us want to know Christ more? Is that something you're really seeking? Or do you just read the Bible because you're supposed to read the Bible? I'm going to give you a prayer written by, not me, by St. Paul, okay, in Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 11 or 12. I think it's actually one of the best, well-rounded prayers that if you can learn this, it actually is so complete. And St. Paul says, this is my prayer for you. So he's talking to Colossians and says, this is what I'm praying for you. Colossians chapter 1, he says, This reason, since the day we heard of it, we do not cease to pray for you, to ask. And this is what we're asking, that you be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and understanding. So number one, I want you to be filled with the knowledge of His will. Remember we said being conformed to His will. Number two, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him. Number three, so that you would walk worthy of God. Number three, being fruitful in every good work. And number four, increasing in the knowledge of God. He says, I, this is what I'm praying for you, that you would know His will, that you would be fruitful in all that you do, that you would be pleasing to Him, and that you would know Him more. And then in the last verse, he says, being strengthened with all might according to His power. He says, and then give me the strength to do this. I think it's actually a perfect prayer if you guys want to start praying it I know you're still trying to wait to catch up on Psalm 62 or 60. That's fine. Do Colossians 1, 9 through 12, that you say, I want to know your will more. I want to know you more. I want to be fruitful in all that I do. And I want to be pleasing to you. Give me the strength to do it. St. Paul, the mature mind, says, I just want to know him more. And then another mature mind is, we talked about this last few weeks, but being content in every situation. Well, how that's a mature mind, not the one who's always begging and asking, looking for themselves. He's so content, he's considering others. He's in prison and he's still trying to help others? Well, you've got nothing. Well, actually, that's not true. He says, if you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6, he says, I have nothing, yet I possess all things. He says, I'm poor, but I'm making many rich. What? How are you poor and making others rich? He's poor because literally he had no material things. How is he making others rich? Because he was giving them Christ. He's giving them Christ. He says, I have nothing and possess all things. I have nothing, literally, but I possess all things because he possesses Christ and the kingdom. And he's so content. That is a mature mind. Last couple of things. You're not going to like the next one. But he wrote it. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 29. So being Christian wasn't super popular at that time. Uh, There were some consequences. And he says in verse 29, because some of them were being persecuted, he says, For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ. Like here's a gift that God gave you, not only to believe in Him. You're very fortunate to be a Christian, but also to suffer for His sake. To look at suffering for Christ's sake as a gift as a blessing. Most of us don't want to get closer to Christ because we're worried that He's going to make us suffer. He's going to hurt our families. He's going to take away all our stuff. And He says, it's actually a gift. And then if you look at chapter 2, verse 14, He says this. He says, I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith. He's like, my life, I'm being just poured out like a drink, right? I'm being poured out as an offering. He says, but I am glad and rejoice. He didn't mind. And then, last part of this suffering thing. Remember when I said where he desires to know him, if you keep going, in chapter 3, he says, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection. 
He wants to know the power of his resurrection, but how does he do it? Through the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. He says, I want to be so Christ-like that I want to know his sufferings, I want to have the fellowship of his sufferings, and I want to be conformed to his death. This idea of be- fellowship of his sufferings, read it, Buna B'Shoi Kamil. A Buna B'Shoi Kamil who loved the cross, and he wasn't looking to suffer, but he accepted it and he embraced it as carrying the cross with Christ. And sometimes we get a cross, and it's a heavy cross, and it's very painful. But the people that are mature see it as I'm sharing with Christ. Abuna Mishra Kamil used to always have this mentality of, I want to be like St. Simon the Cyrene. Who is St. Simon the Cyrene? The one who was told, can you carry Christ's cross on the road to Golgotha? What about us? I want to be the one that shares in the sufferings with Christ, lifting the cross with Christ. So suffering for Christ does not have to be a terrible thing. It actually could be a good thing. Last couple of things, uh, in chapter 3, verse 20 and 21. You should know this one for the, all the one who is baptized, who is going to be baptized. If you have kids that are going to be baptized, it says, our, citizen, our citizenship is in heaven. Our citizen, once you're baptized, you get a heavenly citizenship. He says, from which we eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Christ. We forget that we are citizens of heaven. We think we're citizens of the U.S. and that's it. We take pride in our U.S. passport. But you have a heavenly passport. There's a document. You are sealed. There's a stamp on the passport. You have a seal by the Holy Spirit, as it says in several places in 2 Corinthians and Ephesians. You are sealed. That's your passport. You are sealed. You are a heavenly citizen. Stop thinking that this... You know what you have on earth? You have a visa. You have a visa. You can come here for a little while, you, but you're going back. You're going back to where? To your home. And your home is heaven. Last thing I want to do is I just want to look at St. Paul's prayer in Philippians. So he's told us that God has begun a good work in you. He's working to complete it till the final day. We have to work with him. But what is the goal? To be Christ-like. He gives us one more prayer, something that he cares for, and he thinks this is what we need to be like as well. So in chapter 1, by the way, whenever you find a prayer of St. Paul, pay attention. Like when someone like St. Paul is praying, don't you want to hear what they pray? This is He he has one in Ephesians, one in Philippians, and one in Colossians. So in chapter 1, verses 9 to 11, he says this, And this I pray, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and discernment. No matter how much you love, he says, I want it to grow. A mature Christian who is becoming like Christ, guess what his love is doing or her love? It's growing more and more. So don't stop. Don't think you've reached the height of love, but we have to continue. The best Christians are the ones whose life are marked by love. He says, that you may approve the things that are excellent. Meaning what? That you're rejecting those things that are sinful. That you have a knowledge and a discernment to say, ah, this is beneficial, this will lead me towards Christ, this is hurtful, so I'm not going to approve that. Are we approving the things in our life, accepting all kinds of activities, things that we watch, things that we do, things we waste our time with, that are not beneficial, And how much are we accepting the things that are? If you look at the things that you're approving of, make a list of each. Am I approving more of the things that are beneficial or the things that are not? He says that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. Sincere and without offense, what does that mean? Till the day of Christ, which is judgment day. Your Christianity is not an idea. It's not a bunch of dogmas or doctrines. It's sincerity from your heart. Do you truly love Christ? If you truly love Him, then your desire will be to to please Him. To the point where you don't want to upset Him in any way. That is a mature mindset. He says, last thing, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Christ Jesus. What does that mean? That means that God is working in us, producing fruits of righteousness to the glory and praise of God. I didn't go through all of Philippians. I just chose 
the top 100 verses, sorry. <laughs> but there's so much more in Philippians. It's an incredible book. I hope it will finally make it to one of your top five, um, but let's stand up and pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Our dear Lord Jesus Christ, you are such a beautiful example. How you were so selfless, how you were so obedient, how you considered our interests more than yours. At any time you could have chosen to stop. I guess you considered us of great value. Most people wouldn't. Dear Lord, so much of our mindset is, is just on us. It's just on what we want. It's just on earthly things. I pray, dear Lord, that you would transform our minds. I pray, dear Lord, that you would give us your mindset. After having received your body and blood, I pray that your body and blood would enter into our minds and that your body and blood would transform our minds towards heavenly things, towards things that are pleasing to you. Help us, O Lord, to have your eyes that we might see the suffering and see your image in others. Help us, O Lord, to have your ears that we can hear your call and hear the cries of others. Help us, O Lord, to have your heart that we would have compassion and love for all mankind, those who are sinners and those who are not. Help us, O Lord, to receive them all in your name. I pray, dear Lord, I know that none of us can do this on our own, that you would supply us in abundant grace. I know that you're working in us. Help us, O Lord, to work with you and for you, that our will will be yours, and that we could glorify you. Dear Lord, I pray that you would give us all strength to be one-minded. Help us, O Lord, to run towards the goal together, leaving no man behind. We thank you for your beautiful words that inspire us, encourage us, strengthen us. And I thank you, dear Lord, mostly for you. Thank you for being all that we need and being all that we should desire. I pray for this church that we would be one-minded with the mind of Christ. I ask for your mercy, your forgiveness, your blessing, your grace, your strength. Through the intercession of St. Mary and St. Paul and all those who had a Christ-like mind, Hear us when we say with one voice, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, through Christ Jesus our Lord. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. What are you going to pray this week? Colossians 1, 9 through 12, daily. Colossians 1, 9 through 12, that's your perfect prayer. And also, for those of you that want to, if you want to order konefa, uh, belishta, and syrup, there's a, you can order it downstairs, and there's a QR code here. For those of you that want to order food, like I think they're doing grape leaves, I know the women of the younger generation tend not to make them on their own, so... The older women and the kids are making them for us. So if you want to order it, get it now uh, while you can. Make, make your families happy. So again, the QR code is here, and you can uh, order it downstairs as well. For the kanefa, the water, and everything.